Uh, how's everybody this morning? Everybody good? If you guys will stand up with us, we're going to begin worship this morning. Man, the Bible says in Psalms, it says that um, God inhabits the praises of his people. Um, and the Bible also says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so whenever we begin to worship, we begin to invite his presence. And so our praise actually brings about freedom in this place. And so, man, this morning, let's just lift up our hands. And let's just say, Jesus, you're good. God, you're good in this place. God, we worship you. We magnify you this morning, Lord. And God, we say all the praise belongs to you this morning. God, all of our adoration belongs to you this morning. God, you're a good God that's, that's worthy of all of our praise this morning. So we say, come Holy Spirit.
that you are good. Come on. Don't you know we have a reason to celebrate this morning? Amen. Come on, with a cry. With a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim that you are good. Yeah. That you are good no matter what life looks like. In the sun of rain, my life celebrates that you are good. That you are good And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout
lift you higher You are the only king forever Forevermore You are victorious with your goodness in this place. God, that you would, you would completely consume our hearts. God, that you would, um, God, just completely consume this place with your presence. And Lord Jesus, we just magnify you right now. In Jesus' name.
across the room this morning, let's just raise our hands. Let's just say the name of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Man, it's like that old song. Um, it says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Man, there's just something about the name of Jesus this morning, church. And I'm telling you, the name of Jesus can can break down strongholds. The name of Jesus can break down addiction. The break, the, the name of Jesus can break down depression here in this place. And the name of Jesus brings about freedom, amen. And so we just say, Jesus, 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 come and have your way. Come and have your way in this place, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the, for the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. And we thank you for the blood that that sets us free. We thank you for the name that's above all names. God, be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, as you guys make your way back to your seats, man, you guys are in for a treat this morning. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard Jeremy Watson before? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, man, so Jeremy Watson's here today, and he's going to come and just, just bring the word that God's put on his heart for us. Um, if I could have some guys get this... Um, Hi, so you guys welcome Jeremy Watson. Got a single fan in the back. I appreciate it. Good morning. Why y'all keep inviting me back? I don't know. I love you guys. I do. I do have something to share with you this morning. I believe it's going to challenge you, push you. I hope we get a laugh a few times, but to be honest, I'm an intense person, and I like driving, diving straight into the bottom of it. This morning, any time in your life, the only reason you won't be inspired, motivated, pushed in anything you do is because you're not looking for the right thing. You're not open for that moment. You're not asking yourself the right questions. We're not promised tomorrow, and that weighs heavily on me every day of my life. There's a lot of questions I ask myself every day. And this morning, we're going to talk about some of those questions. Questions that push us to be better people. Questions that push us to be stronger, tougher for Christ and for the kingdom. So I'll ask you, so, you're, you, ask you this morning just to buckle yourselves in, to get ready for some things that I hope step on your toes that push you and stretch you from where you are now. Whether you've never heard any of these questions, whether you've never been to church, or you, whether you've been to church all of your life, I don't care. I hope this morning that you allow yourself to be pulled into the presence of God, to allow his love and his mercy and his grace to expose things in you that you can lay at his feet and that you can grow in. I'm gonna read some verses this morning, but before we do, I'm gonna pray real quick. Um, I don't have any magic tricks for you this morning. I'm just an average guy. I got some uh, things with you to share with you this morning that I believe God's put in my heart, and I pray that uh, you'd stick with me for a few minutes. I'll be short and sweet and to the point, and then we can go have some lunch. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your, your trust, for allowing me just to be an instrument that you could use to share your word and your truth with people. That I even have the privilege of being able to talk about you and your truth. That I have the privilege to be in a place where we can worship you freely. And Lord, that I'm in a position to where I've recognized that I've been saved by your mercy and your grace and that I've been given a gift that I cannot pay back on my own. But thankfully that you do not require anything in return for me other than my commitment and my heart to you. I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you would pull us, poke us, and prod us this morning in ways that helps us remember exactly who you created us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, this morning, the biggest question, the biggest thought I have for us Okay, and what I titled my message is, it's when we forget who we are. When we forget who we are, things get messed up. 
when we forget who we are, things begin to change. And it's not for the positive. When we forget who we are, I become selfish. I become motivated by things that will not last for an eternity. When I forget who I am, I begin to use people for my own gain. When I forget my own identity, I forget the value and the identity of those around me. And when I forget who I am, I forget who created me. And I, when I forget who created me, I'm now thinking about things that are no longer any benefit to me. And so this morning, we are gonna address the situation and the issue of when we forget who we are. I'm gonna be reading some verses this morning. I'm gonna read the whole section, Romans 5, 1 through 11. I just wanna start off reading the scripture this morning. I want you to hear exactly what God has created you to be, who he's called you to be, who he's declared you to be. I want you to hear it straight from him before I say anything else this morning. And if we're honest with ourselves, reading the scripture, if we truly dive in, allow our minds and our hearts to be taken by what we're about to read, I could read simply that and we could go home. Because when you think about the scripture, when you think about who wrote that, when you think about who gave it to us, and when you think about what he meant and intended for it to be when we read it, it's the only thing that can give us the sustenance and the life-giving power we need to move on every day. I'm here as an echo of what the Bible's gonna tell you this morning. So that when the Bible speaks something this morning and you hear my echo going and going and going, it's just a reinforcement of the author and what he penned to you this morning. Before I read this, I can't stress enough, you have to make this personal this morning. Because it's becoming alarming of how easy we as humans are forgetting the value at which we were created with with the awe in which we were created with. We were created by a God that speaks things into motion, that speaks physical things into being, and who gave us his identity to have a relationship with him and orchestrate a planet of people that take care of him or us and each other as he takes care of us. It's overwhelming when you get to the bottom of it, of it and you think of who wrote these words to me, to you this morning. And when we remember the motivation in your life to do things that you've never done before suddenly increases because you now have the fuel to push your locomotive, the life that you have down the tracks in a different direction that you thought you could never go because he has things to give you this morning that you may have never tasted or never possessed in your life before. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Mm, peace is a good word, isn't it? It's not much peace going around among people today. There's not many people offering me peace. They're offering me things. They're offering me things I can spend my money on. They're offering me opportunities to spend more time doing things away from my family or away, away from the people that matter most, but peace is not something that's spread around very often these days. But with God, it's something that he gives generously. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us you see at just the right time we were all still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though a good person someone might possibly dare to die for. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, while we were still broken, while we were still lost, while we were still shouting, 
for him to be crucified while we were still evil while we were still selfish prideful self-serving Christ died for us since we have now been justified by his blood how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him for if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life not only is this so but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation those verses speak highly of the value that you carry before you even had the choice to choose whether you were going to buy into this thing that Jesus Christ was doing this crazy enigma of a man who was going around in ancient times talking about eating his body and drinking his blood and sharing with people that he is the son of God before you had the option to choose that he died I don't know many people willing in the room to pay for something that you're not guaranteed to receive. And I'm not talking about 10 bucks. I'm talking about guaranteed to stake your 401k on something that you're not guaranteed to receive. Your ultimate gift, everything you have to give, your family, your belongings, your career, to give it to something that you're not guaranteed to receive anything in return. God did that Jesus was not guaranteed that a single single human being would turn and trust in him on this planet and he gave he gave deeply he gave richly he gave with commitment and promise he gave sacrificially because he saw value he saw value in us and he saw value in the opportunity that we might see him we might see his love and we might give our lives to him and his promises some of the questions I have this morning that I've been wrestling with I've been struggling with Here as of late that have just been weighing on my heart and weighing on my mind one of them is, is how have we gotten here as human beings where it's okay to treat each other the way we do on average in our culture and it is acceptable how did we come from a place where we had a creation in the Garden of Eden and we made a choice to be banished but how do we forget so quickly as humans can't blame Adam and Eve I'm asking us because if we were there we would have done the same thing how do we forget something so glorious and promising so quickly how do I forget the times in my life where God has touched my heart and things have just melted away and I've trusted in him and I'll go two three days or weeks at a time and suddenly I'm back in the grind where I'm just moving around I'm stressed I'm busy I'm struggling I'm unmindful of my kids and my wife because I'm so focused on the things that I have going in my day that I have forgotten what the garden tasted like. How did we get here? I don't have an answer. There are things that have contributed, but there are things in our own lives personally, each of us, where we have laid things aside that matter so much and we have picked up things that we carry every day that won't matter ever again and we've let them consume us oh and that breaks my heart at the times where my kids they'll come ask daddy let's play let's play I'm busy right now and I'm really not my mind is busy but I've had days where my mind was going so much and I was so stressed out that I would just sit blankly stare at a wall trying to sort through things in my mind and miss opportunities Now, don't get me wrong, life is tough. But if I'm going to choose in that moment from now on, my hope is that I will cut out the things that are stressful to me and sacrifice that. Sacrifice the opportunity to sit down, sort through things in my mind, and figure a solution out. 
and choose to go spend time with my kids. Because if I'm going to put one or the other off, it has blown my mind time and time again that I've put off something as precious as my kids to sort through the end of a busy day. How have we gotten here? How did I get there? It's because I have forgotten who I am. And when I forget who I am, I forget how precious those little kids are. When you forget who you are, you forget how valuable the cashier is at Allsup's. Your coworkers are. And you will allow yourself to feel justified in being so busy throughout your day, you will feel justified in making sure you get something done and overlook somebody struggling through something with their family or an emotion or something that you could reach out and help them with and show them the love of God, the truth of God. You will feel justified because you've forgotten who you are. So you can no longer see who they are. And what you have on the forefront of your mind seems like the most important thing at the moment. Because we've forgotten who we are. Where did hospitality go? Where did it go? I read about times in the Bible where people would travel from town to town and they knew that when they got there that somebody would be willing to let them stay in their home, feed them, give them something to wash their feet off in, their hands in, because hospitality was something that was ingrained in us as humans. Because you knew that if you wanted to go to another town in those times and travel, you would hope that somebody would have an open door for you when you got there. It was common sense, I believe, to us as the human race in the beginning of time that if you needed something, you would hope somebody would be there so that when you saw somebody that needed something, your immediate thought was, I'm going to be there. Where has hospitality gone? How do cars sit so long on the side of the road these days with nobody stopping? Now, I get it. I don't ask my wife not to stop. Because once again, we have people that have forgotten who they are that sometimes you can be put in a situation. But I got an old truck. I have a tow rope I carry everywhere. If I see uh, flashing hazards and I don't have anywhere that's an emergency to be, I'm stopping. Because if I'm on the side of the road, and especially with my kiddos, and I need to get my vehicle off the side of the road, I need somebody who's caring enough and has a rope to move my vehicle. Does that make sense? But it doesn't happen because we've forgotten who we are. Thankfully, Jesus did not forget who he was. He had moments, 33 years worth of opportunities and moments to say, no, this is, I know what's coming. I know what I'm here for. He knew. He's the king of, he's the son of the king of the universe. He knew what he was there for. He could have said, I'm here, this hurts, I'm struggling, this is going to be painful, I can't carry this. He could have stopped communicating with the Father, he could have forgotten who he was and backed out. And we wouldn't have the opportunity that we have today at redeeming salvation in Jesus Christ. But luckily he did not forget who he was. In the garden he begged before he was going to the cross, please God, please dad, if you can, please let this cup pass from me. Because it's going to hurt. I know what's coming. It's not just the nails. It's not just the cross. It's what you're going to put on me spiritually. It's when you're going to turn your back from me and disown me and look at me in shame because I'm going to carry the sins of these people who are yelling to kill me. Please take it from me, Dad. But if you won't, I'm going to walk in who I am as the sacrifice, as the chosen lamb to finish this job. I'm going to walk in mental toughness, physical toughness, because he was a man at this time, a person. And he said he's going to finish it. And we know by what the Bible says, what we just read, that he did sacrifice himself for us and that his dad said, no, it has to be done. Because neither one of them forgot who he was and what he was there to do. And I'm eternally grateful for that.
Where is commitment gone? Where has the ability to see things, not, not uh, ability is the wrong word, we all have the ability, where has the initiative to see things through gone on average? Now, as I ask these questions, if you are a very committed person, uh, if you're a very hospitable person, please know I'm not trying to come at you. I work in education, okay, I work with kids, I enjoy working with kids. And if anybody else works with kids as a group, okay, you can clearly see a year-to-year -year difference and where we as a culture are going. It's kind of like a thermometer because that's our future generation of people that are coming up in our country. And the amount of commitment is decreasing. The amount of hospitality is decreasing. The amount of students in my school that are willing to serve their, their fellow classmates, to serve uh, the uh, administrators or the adult figures, the authority figures in their school is decreasing. I've been self-serving in my life. I'm just seeing it more and more prevalent across the board in our country as we move forward. That's all I'm getting at. But I am challenging me this morning. These are questions I'm asking myself. If they don't apply to you, please, I'm not trying to come at you. If they do, I am asking you to hold on to them. I'm asking you to apply them, and I'm asking you to see what God would have you do about them. That is what I'm asking you. If you are hospitable, I'm asking you to spread hospitality. The kids need it in our generations that are coming up. If you are a very committed person, I'm, I'm asking you to show the students in your church what commitment looks like so that they can see someone doing it on a day-to-day -day basis and they can have an example to do it. That's what I'm asking. But where has commitment gone? I, li I love to read uh, uh, fiction stories. I really love to read uh, uh, Christian fiction stories. They challenge me in my faith. They really ask questions in a uh, story type setting with characters and it's got a plot and a theme and I like really putting myself in those situations. It's almost like watching a TV show to me with a very positive output but it really pushes me to the core to ask myself every day who I am and then I get to, it's like a hobby to me. There is a Francine Rivers, she's a, an, an uh, author that I like to read and she has a three book series called Mark of the Lion series. And it is based in ancient times, and it's based around uh, a situation where um, you have a group of people. Um, the countries are named different things. The group of people are named different things. It's not like Rome and Greece and uh, Israel and things like that. But it's based on people that follow um, what would be our God in our faith. And they are facing a time of persecution and struggle. It's the same thing as when they built the arenas, and they were thrown in there for entertainment. And they were persecuted for their faith. And if people found out, they were jailed. They were murdered, okay, they were executed. This is the type of book that we're reading through and this author mixes in this, this hope and the challenges and, and the adversity that someone might go through in that situation. And, and it challenged me what I would do in those, those times. But when I read those books that are themed in, in that time of, of life and mankind when people were riding around on horses and People were fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat often, and people were chivalrous, and there was character, and you didn't have a, a huge need for police officers because, because people were out um, taking care of their communities and patrolling, and they were, uh, uh, on average, honorable and just, and they would hold people accountable for their actions. In those types of settings, there were many times where people's lives had been spared or somebody's life had been saved uh, maybe by a warrior or a king or uh, maybe even a woman through healing and, and, and throughout these stories. And when that would happen in a different time in our, our existence, in our race, in human history, people would say, thank you, thank you for saving my life. Or if a king or a judge would let somebody go from a, a payment or a judgment, he would say, thank you for sparing me. And those people would turn around and say, my life is now indebted to you. Because without your actions, without your decision, without your grace to give me my life back, I wouldn't have it. So in all reality, it's yours. I'm now here to serve you in whatever I can with my life. My life is indebted to you. They were committed. They were committing their lives to the person who had given them the gift of life back in return. 
that moment. We have an opportunity this morning to either recognize for the first time in your life if you've never heard this story or to be reminded if you're like me and you've forgotten multiple times that Jesus Christ has died and without him you have nothing I mean nothing you may have money in the room you may have a career you love you may have a very good life but if you do not have Jesus Christ I'm telling you right now you have nothing I don't say that to be mean I say that to be urgent because what we have in Jesus Christ what I have in Jesus Christ will go immediately beyond my grave into my existence into eternity in heaven I can't paint exactly what that'll look like for you but I have hope and faith that that's exactly what it's going to happen because he told me it would that's what I have because when we die on this planet when you die you become the most generous person in the world because you give everything you have away at that moment you don't get to take anything with you your name your career your status your influence your house your money nothing you give everything away and I've never in my life before given away everything I own just to be generous so then when that day comes that's going to happen I'm okay with it because now I know I have something that is of much more value than I could ever accrue on this planet and that's on the days when I remember who I am where has quality and consistent parenting gone This is a question for, I have five-year-olds. I've got, I've got a long ways to go. And I see something at the schools that you better believe is challenging me as a parent and is raising some red flags. We as parents, you could be a perfect parent here and your kids are probably most, almost 100% are going to make bad choices. We are. Not, not almost. 100% your kids are going to make bad choices. My kids do it. We have to correct them. And if your kids are in a situation where they have chosen to go from where you've led them to and you've been a good parent, you've modeled love, you've modeled what Jesus has created them to be and they've gone the other way, you have the hope of praying for them to return to what you've taught them to be. And the Bible promises that if you raise a child in the way he should go, he will return to it or she will. If you have not done that and they are older and gone, it's not too late to change what you've done in the past and to show them now hospitality, commitment, love, consistency, grace, mercy. Because until you're gone or until they're gone, there is hope that Christ can impact any of our lives and wreck our worlds and change who we are. So today's the day. No matter which group you're in, me, as an educator, on average, I see a decrease in committed, consistent, quality parenting. I didn't say perfect parents. Nobody's a perfect parent. But the amount of kids that I see that do not have a parent contact on their records or that live with aunts, uncles, or grandparents has increased dramatically. Now, I'm thankful for those family members that take those kids in. I'm not saying that they do not have, um, they have nothing. But I know from enough time spending in relationships with people in my life that did not have parents growing up, what it means to have that void there. Where is it gone? The biggest mentor in my life has said that kids are a reflection of their parents. Not a mirror image, a reflection, almost like you would see in a, a rippled pond or something. They're a reflection, they're similar. They carry your guidance, your wisdom, your character. They have their own personalities, they make their own decisions, but they are a reflection of you. And so what we see at the schools are simply kids modeling 
what they are taught, whether it's right or wrong. And on average, they're being taught things that push them further and further away from who they were created to be. And so when they forget who they were created to be and their value, they see nobody else around them as having value. You can't tell me that as a person you treat a piece of paper with the same respect and value as you would a golden bar. If you don't see value in it, you're not gonna care for it the same way you would as something that has immeasurable value. So when the students aren't taught, they don't show. We as parents are challenged to be in our kids' lives in such a way that when we love them and guide them and show them the truth of who they were created to be in Christ and show them the love, the mercy, and grace, that when they plunge off into that decision that is selfish and prideful and destructive, that when they reap the rewards of what that decision is, they are able to measure it in one hand, what they have grown up in in, in the other hand, and suddenly say, how does this taste? How does this feel compared to what I've experienced, what I've been taught? And it's it's supposed to be in such direct contrast that when they taste the fruit of what they chose to do in opposition of what they were raised to do, they immediately want to go back to what they've been shown to do because it tastes so much less appetizing. But when a kid tastes something that they've chosen to do and it either tastes similar or better than what they've been given before, they're going to immediately drop everything that's been instilled with them and they're going to fight for their own because they've been watching people in their life day after day fight for their own, fight to protect their own, fight for theirs, fight for their name, for their money and they're gonna do the same thing because they think that when they've watched other people get what they fight for and they have massive amounts of it that it'll taste even sweeter one day. But they don't know that it's just a perpetual cycle of chasing after more and more and more. So quality, consistent parenting, you show them in such a way that when they fall, when they they make a bad decision, when they're hurting, when they're broken, that they have such a support system, that they have such an identity in Christ that no matter what is rocking around them in their lives, that it tastes so sweet and so good to have the support, the promises, the trust, the protection of somebody, not only God, but you, to care for them, to guide them, to answer their questions, that they realize that these choices right here are bumpy and rocky and they want to immediately decrease the amount of decisions they make like that because of what you've been around them. Not because of what you've said around them, because of what you've been around them. You've shown commitment. You don't talk about commitment, you show commitment. You don't talk about hospitality, you are hospitality. They have seen you invite people into your home. They have seen you pay for somebody's groceries at the store. They have seen you give Christmas presents to people in need. They have seen you pay for somebody's electric bill because you see value in other people. That way when your kids are on their own one day and for some reason you might not be there and they're struggling with their electric bill, they are hopeful that somebody like you is on the planet that will say, these people are valuable and they're struggling. I'm gonna help them pay that bill or that your kids see somebody else and they do the same for them. Consistent quality parenting, we have to remember who we are and God will inspire you, motivate you, give everything you need, give you everything you need to be the parent you need to be, the coworker you need to be, the husband you need to be, the teacher, coach. If you're coaching your kids in sports, you're coaching the other little, anything you need to be, he'll give it to you. You just have to remember who you are and who he is to you. Where is, where has mental and physical toughness gone? I talked about Jesus being mentally and physically tough a while ago. That's not an easy decision to pay for somebody's electric bill when you gotta pay for your own. I mean, let's be honest. It's not easy to pay for something that somebody's needing in their life when you wanna pay for something that you just want. I'll be honest, I got a list right now of things I want. It takes mental and physical toughness to be sacrificial, 
It's something that has to be around. It's something that was modeled by people that would go out and stand for character and integrity, stand for people, stand for our faith, stand for our Father, stand for His name, stand for the God of Israel. Kids would hear stories of people going and not backing down to the life or death of them. And it was proclaimed throughout villages, communities of men and women that either were victorious in standing or lost their lives in standing, but that they stood. The kids knew that it took toughness, mental and physical toughness, to make those decisions. But we live in a society where things are becoming much easier to do every day. I don't have to go to a well to draw my water. I don't have to go to an outhouse to go to the restroom. I can flip a light switch. I've got machines that'll wash my clothes and my dishes. Thank goodness I hate washing dishes. Amen, you know what I'm saying? It just becomes easier though. I don't have to read a map going, I don't know how people did that back in the day. I missed the turn with the GPS. The little robot ladies, turn right now. Dang it, I missed it again. Rerouting, I get it lady. That's the seventh time you're rerouting me. I can't imagine the amount of struggles me and my wife would have if she's tracing a piece of paper over there with a dim light and I'm blaming her and she's blaming me. And suddenly we realize the map's upside down. I don't know how. It has become easier. And so things of mental and physical toughness have not become so much a requirement to get by because there's something else that'll do it for you. When we forget who we are, we forget the values of others. We've talked about that. I have a student on my football team this last season, and he's one of those kids that he just says off the wall stuff all the time. By the time he puts his shoulder pads on, his helmet on, he's got no neck. He's committed and he just run, if you ask him to come over here, he's run over there and stop. And, but when he says off the wall stuff, you know, like salmon crackers, you're like, what are you? I coached salmon, salmon crackers, I had them, they're good. I was telling the kids they're good. He's just very intense person. Well, when he was going to, I'm an intense person, it's not a bad thing, it's just, it's setting up the story. When we would go to a football game, one of our lineman coaches, he was a lineman, had told the kid that when they are cutting the other team, that they have to get a really good push, okay, and that you're trying to get through there, okay, almost like you're trying to break their knees. So we're in the end of our first game, we're at home, he's standing behind me on the sideline, the ref is just a few feet away, and we're, we have a good game going, we're up. And he's getting excited, he's getting into it, he's yelling, and suddenly he just throws his head back, eyes closed, and yells, break their knees, break their knees. I'm like, no, stop, stop yelling that. The refs kind of turn around like, I was like, no, he didn't, that's not what he's, he's not meaning to break. I so I have to go talk to him, he's like, oh, oh, so, sorry, coach. And he was genuinely concerned that he said something wrong, but it was the way he said it. He was just saying, cut them. But he's yelling, break their knees. And I'm like, we're not in the mafia, zip it. Tone it down. <laughs> the ref is going to throw a flag on you right now. You need to simmer down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. And later I got the story of what our lineman coach had shared with him, and it made sense. But I say all that to say this. We have people in life that are willing to cut other people at their knees to gain whatever they can. because they do not see the identity and the worth of who created them to be the person they were created to be. They do not see the opportunity they could have in a relationship with that person. And a lot of times in the relationships in my life, I've found that I've benefited more from those relationships instead of using that person for my benefit. Let me say that again. I've benefited more from the relationship than I've benefited from using them to gain something. But too many times we don't take a moment to find that out because we're cruising right on past people. The real you that you desire can be different than the real you that God intended. 
but the true you will always be who God created. When you forget who you are, you need to remember this. I'm gonna say it again. The real you that you desire can be different than the real you that God intended. You can choose to go another route. I choose often to go another route. I forget. But the true you will always be who God created. And if you hold on to that, you can always go back to the one who is the solution. These, these questions that I'm asking this morning that I'm hoping that you're asking yourself, there are many different directions I could go chasing down a solution. But through getting prepared for this message and through asking these questions in my life, one thing has dawned on me. I don't, I don't want to chase solutions. I want to chase the one that is the solution. Amen. It's not that you have to come up with something to solve the problems in your life. You just have to go to the one who is the solution to the problems of your life. And if somebody that'll care for you so much to die for you before you even acknowledge that he was even there will teach you how to care for your wife, your kids, your coworkers. He'll teach you how to care for your money, your house, your future, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, your siblings, your schoolwork, your career. He'll teach you how to take care of all of it. So it's not this morning that I'm asking you these questions so you can start doing a lot of good things to be better for Christ and be more who he created you to be. I'm telling you that you simply, if you recognize these questions and that, that they're there, you can rest in knowing that he will provide you the things that will help you walk through these questions and show you who you need to be. He's a good father. He won't talk about it. He will be about it. And he will show you commitment. He will show you hospitality. When catastrophe hits your doorstep, he will show you how to hold people through tears and snot and crying and pain because he'll do it for you. No matter if you ever feel like you're alone, he is always there for you. And if you never see an example of these things that we're talking about today, because sometimes I get frustrated and I'm thinking, you know, I want these things so bad in my life. I want other people to show them. But if there's not an example in your life for these things, you have to be that example. It has to start with someone somewhere. You cannot give yourself the reason of saying, well, I'm, I have to wait for somebody to show me the path. No, you blaze a trail. You don't wait for somebody to clear a trail. You don't have time to, because there's a good chance nobody will. There's a good chance that a lot of people around you in your life may never remember or be exposed or choose to tap into who they're created to be. But if you blaze that trail and they suddenly see what's at the end of that trail and what you have in your life and the peace that you have in your life, they will want to remember who they are because they see what it looks like when you remember who you are. Because it's contagious. It's motivational. It's inspirational. It's something that creates a hunger inside of people. That's what Jesus did. He never sinned. He, he just reflected who the Father was. That is why he, he, he had crowds of people flocked to him. Billy Graham, I'm not saying he didn't sin. Billy Graham, though, was a person who was good at just reflecting who the Father was. If you ever listen to his messages, he was simple. He read the word, he preached the Bible, and people came in thousands to listen to what he was telling them about Jesus. That's who they were drawn to. If you reflect him, it will create desire in you and others. I don't mean fake it. I don't mean pretend. I mean, if you be who God created you to be, it will be contagious. I'm going to read the scriptures that we start off with one last time so that you remember who God says you are. Remember, I'm just an echo this morning of what the word says you are this morning. And I'm only going to read verses 6 through 11. You see, at just the right time when we were all still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved? Shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. His actions prove your value. I'm gonna be honest with you. I would probably say no to giving up my life for the people in this room right now, just saying I gotta pay for their sins. He did that for you. Because he sees things that I don't. Can you imagine being asked to give your life in payment for something or someone and you do it, it communicates value. So if you ever doubt how valuable you are to God, you have to remember. You don't have to hear what he said about it. Just look what he did about it. What we say in our lives are a, pro a, a protest, a declaration of what we believe. Our actions are evidence for those words. You can say stuff all day long, but as soon as you back them up with actions, I now see that it really matters to you. He didn't just talk about it. He died for you. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for today. Thank you for your love, your care. Thank you for your example. That we could have somebody that has given so much, so richly, so deeply to follow in the example of. We wouldn't be able to give ourselves an out when it hurts to give because you've given you've asked us to give you've asked us to be like you and we don't have a reason to say well they just talked about it they haven't really ever you have shown it we have no way out and not being like you and giving the love that you've given us to others freely i pray that you'd help us remember who we are that you'd inspire us to be full of your mercy and your grace Let's all stand up this morning, Lord. And um, man, just as he just said, um, just for us to remember who we are, you know, we first have to remember who he is. Amen. And so, man, um, this morning we just get to remember what Jesus um, has done for us just by partaking in um, our communion um, with him. And just remember the blood that was shed on the cross and his, his body that was broken for us. And so um, as we come... Um, we're just going to uh, continue in worship this morning. So I uh, want you come this morning.
such a good job as he always does and the worship team man so excited so we got a few announcements this week on tuesday night we have a live cast with dave ramsey we got a short video we spent two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned we were bankrupt changed my life so i know how it feels to be there i've been there done that that began a quest to figure out how money really works. We don't talk about problems, we talk about solutions. We must understand we've got an opportunity. Take that short-term sacrifice for incredible long-term results. You've probably not had anybody tell you that you can do this. You can change the story. I want to challenge you. What could you do today? I want you to dream a dream that you can't imagine not achieving. You'll start to gain traction. You'll start to win with money and ultimately live the life you want to live. So how do we get it back? How do we awaken this wonder in our lives? The caliber of your life is going to be depending upon the choices you make right now. If you can be focused and you can be intense, you can do this stuff. 
This is not Siri. This stuff works. Again, louder! All right, so that'll be Tuesday night from 7 to 10. Come be a part of that. It's free, um, and we'll use that as kind of our kickoff for sign-up to roll into a financial peace class in January. So come be a part of that. Also, um, Saturday night, we have a men's night. And, man, if you've never been, it's, it's only about an hour. We do some worship. They'll be here to do worship, and then um, we're going to have a, a short testimony Man, it's a great time to fellowship with other men in the church. So, man, I just ask you guys try to try to try to carve out an hour on Saturday night to be here because you will be blessed by that. Um, if you're a first time visitor, or even if you missed the first time, um, we've got a gift for you. If you'll see Calvin back in the window back there, wave Calvin. Um, we want to get your information so we can contact you. Um, go fill out one of those cards and get that free gift from the church. We'd, we'd uh, really like to have a record of your, your visit here. And then finally, today is church potluck. And I've been back there helping put food out, but I, I want to give a shout out to Tony Witt and Kayla Stribling and Jackie West and Calvin because they've really been working hard back there. Um, so after we get done here, um, you visitors go get your card filled out, but then the rest of y'all can go... Um, Get, get in line and get something to eat. And even if you didn't bring anything, stay in fellowship with our family. This church is more about just coming to church on Sunday. It's about being family. So let's let's break bread together and fellowship. It's it's really easy to fellowship over some of Susan's peach cobbler. And so so come and be a part of that, guys. If you can help us get some chairs out so we can put some chairs back here. That or I mean some tables out so we can put tables back here because we'll need some more out. I'd appreciate that. Um, let me pray you out, and that way we don't have to bless the food again, and uh, we can go eat. So, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this church family. I thank you for everybody that's here today, Lord. I thank you for the blessing of the worship and the message that we shared today, Lord. I just ask that this food that we uh, go to partake in would draw us closer to you and closer to each other, Lord. Help us to fellowship. Help every family to be blessed today, Lord. Bless this food that we might might be the church and go out and be bold and serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.